What would be the best animal to hurl at your enemy's castle or fortress for maximum damage? Well, most people would think that a cow would not be a particularly good animal. <laughs> but their large size actually is an advantage because um, the weight goes up with the volume. And the volume is a factor of the length cubed, whereas the surface area and the, the air drag depends on the surface area, only goes up with the length squared. And so the weight increases <laughs> faster than the air drag. And a, a big animal like a cow is going to be better to plow through the air than a small animal like a chicken. <laughs> The question for the panel, what kind of damage would a cow cause? Fascinating. <laughs> uh, it depends on uh, where, where it is, I guess. Could, could, wonderful. That was terrific. I have no idea what he just said. Lots of math in that one. Wonderful. Second question. Question two. Specifically, how would one hurl a cow with a trebuchet? Well, first of all, does everybody know what a trebuchet is? Uh, if you're familiar with the with the seesaw, a teeter totter, where I mean, you've seen in the movie like uh, Young Frankenstein, where the the Frankenstein monster sits on the teeter totter and the girl flings into the room. Well, that could never happen because whatever speed is on one side of the teeter totter is going to be the same speed that the girl was launched from the other side. But in the case of a catapult. They make the lever arms different lengths. And so um, where the force would be applied to, to, to launch is much shorter than the end, uh, you know, where the load would be placed. And so typically they were, you know, from six to one, four to one ratio of arm length. But then as well, on the long end, they actually had the, uh, the, 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 the weight that was being thrown was, was in a sling. And so, you know, like David and Goliath, where they where he slung the stone. Well, the same thing. A stone would be on the on the end of that. And so, it with the with that kind of a difference in in lever arm, um, the weight dif difference would need to be a factor of about eighty times. In other words, you need about an eighty time larger counterweight than the thing that's being thrown. So, like with the cow maybe 1,600 pounds, that would, you need about 130 pound, 130,000 pound counterweight to launch it. It seems like a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking, usually, and they were built on site as well, so they didn't typically throw things as large as cows, <laughs> although they could be built large enough to do so. Um, we, we need to, we, we'll need to stockpile a lot of rocks, I guess. <laughs> could you... Could you could you could you give us some sort of a uh, of, of a comparison of what uh, uh, you know th how how much weight it would take in a trebuchet to launch a cow something we can understand. Well, I will say something that you can understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. That would be a hundred and thirty thousand tall boys. Okay, so if you put 130,000 tall boys in your counterweight, and these, again, to put things in perspective, these trebuchets were pretty commonly, you know, like 100 feet tall. So that's like 250 cans of beer stacked end to end. So if you had 125 cases, picture 125 cases of rain here. Okay, does that, does that put things in your, in your kind of terms? She only speaks PBR. It's like a Friday, <laughs> yeah, Friday and Saturday night hall. Yes. That's a great deal. Uh, and finally, sir, one last question. Um, <clears throat> a little more specific here, getting into the physics of things. What would be required if, hypothetically, hypothetically, one wish to hurl a largest, say, mammal from, hypothetically, the top of the Douglas Bridge, let's just say something we all know, to say, I don't know, hypothetically, 716 Calhoun Avenue, let's just say, a distance of approximately 0.75 miles. What would that take? Well, first you're going to want to make sure the governor's home. 
<laughs> and um, they plated uranium. You know, I remember something back in the 80s, a neutron bomb that wouldn't damage architecture. Oh, right. It went through it. It was an all... all yeah, it, it, it was the rays. It was, rays and it would... The, the people would be sacrificed, but the but the building would still be there. The infrastructure stayed. Yeah. Yeah. Even though cows. <laughs> yeah, wasn't it though? Do you, who remembers that? Did everybody else, when you when you heard about it, think what a sick-minded individual came up with that? Yes. You know who? A scientist. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sir Ben Coleman here for joining us today. Uh, and uh, you can, you, you may leave any time. We, well, we have, well, we'll take questions from the audience in a minute. We have to make sure we get to all of our guests before, but thank you. Is it a really good question? I just want to know if it covers the cow in butter. That's not a really good question. <laughs> like for Aaron, did they sh did they shave the cow? Our viscosity. You're not thinking of last angle in Paris, are you? Okay. And well. moving along, why do you bring him out in public? I honestly don't know. Coleman. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to please welcome to the floor um, uh, the, the PLA, ASLA, ISA, many many other A's. Please welcome Sir Christopher Myrtle here. For those of you who haven't listened to him go on and on about himself, he is the principal landscape architect at Corvus Designs, professionally licensed landscape architect in the state of Alaska, certified arborist with the International Society of Arboriculture. <laughs> in my 25 plus years of floral expertise, I've filled the roles as shrubber, but currently I toil as one who specifies and designs trees and not ones who actually plants. Like, see, I actually do the physical work, clearly. We are so excited to have him here. Sir, I ask you first of all, there you are. Good My goodness, wonderful. What is a shrubbery? And briefly tell us about their history. Well, a shrubbery. Oh boy. I won't go there. Shrubberies are, are just misconceived. It's not one plant, it's a whole bunch of plants. And you'll see in chapter 25 of the movie tonight, the Knights of Knee asked King Arthur, me, 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 me. Sir Arthur, and uh, what's the other dude? Uh, Bedivere? Bedivere. Sir Bedivere. When they're trying to get to the Bridge of Death to see the Enchanter through the forest, they come across them and they say that you must bring me a shrubbery. shrubbery. Now, most people think it's just one plant, but a shrubbery is not one plant. It never has been. Um, it started off in the early 19th century. It was an English phenomenon right after the cottage industry, uh, the cottage garden homes, with lots of flowers and stuff, they started getting into shrubs. And the idea was that, again, it was an English thing, the idea was that you created these large masses of herbaceous plant material. And something very new in English garden design. And it usually had a winding path through it. So the idea is that you would walk through and the shrubbery would give you a little privacy and the ability to move through the landscape. So that is what a shrubbery is. Um, actually, 19, no, I'm gonna pull out a note because I've got a quote, if I may. Please. I had a quote. <laughs> was it down before? <laughs> there it is. Thank you, oh, thank you. That's more than a quote, that's a page. <laughs> <laughs> Bad vision. Um, anyway, so. Uh, Yes, exactly. Uh, Jane Austen wrote about shrubberies for the first time in uh, 1914, and she says, I would have a very pretty shrubbery, or sorry, 1814, sorry. I would have a very pretty shrubbery. One likes to get out into a shrubbery in fine weather. So that was Jane Austen in 1814. And John Spicer looks again. Yes, we all do. And actually, the uh, Knights of Knee actually, <laughs> actually, those formerly who said Knee, because they come across them a second time, they ask for expansion of the shrubbery after they come across Roger the Shrubber. There's no such thing as a shrubber. That doesn't exist. It's just something made up. But uh, when they bring, uh, I think they're English laurels is what I think is the shrub they brought them. Lovely, lovely zone six plant. Uh, evergreen, grows very fast. 
uh, can be cut into a hedge and layered. But oh, hedge, so that's what I want to ask about. What does a bustle in your hedgerow really mean? There's a naked woman. There's a, oh, yeah. it's the bustle. Wow. Yes, okay. the bustle. The bustle. The bustle. Um, so plant, anyway, plant page. Plant page. So anyway, the second time King Arthur, they, they fulfill their task and they bring the shrubbery. Um, they're asked to bring more shrubbery to expand the shrubbery with many layers. And that actually is good garden design is to have a multi-leveled shrubbery because it provides privacy. And wind protection for your And field. wind protection, exactly. But what's little known is in 1974, <laughs> I told you, I'm going to give them useful information, no, not comic relief. In 1974, actually, in England, shrubbery meant a woman of ill repute. So there's the concern whether the, yeah, you didn't know that in England. 19, in the early 70s, a shrubbery was a lady of the evening. So we're the, lady, we're the knights of knee asking for some special attention. And Monty Python was just taking the mickey out of them and gave them a shrubbery. Fascinating. And of course, you all know what a shrubbery is now in the Urban Dictionary. A shrub. Children, plug your ears. No, I won't say. Ask Colette, she'll tell you later. <laughs> is the shrubber the madam then? Don't look it up. That's right, no, there's, no. No, there's no shrubbers. That's no. Right. So, question number three. Okay. No. You weren't expecting this one. No. You were. Tell us briefly, briefly, <laughs> what would be some nice shrubberies here in Juno? Something nice, not too expensive. But pretty. But pretty. But pretty. Pretty. Zone three at the glacier, zone four downtown, sometimes five. And, and really a lovely shrubbery. Spireas are great. They grow in a range of sizes from six inches tall to about eight feet tall. So spireas are good. Always a fan of native plant material, blueberries, um, dogwoods, um, resting in is a great one. Um, but really, in terms of other things, what's that? Rhodes. Rhododendrons work well, yes, uh, but really there's a whole variety of plants and in terms of creating that even shrubbery look, I would, maybe a yew would be good, but I'd, I'd stick with the yews and a yew is a clipped hedge, it's around the governor's house where the cow just landed. <laughs> Lovely clipped hedges, but generally shrubberies are clipped to a certain degree. So plants that enjoy a clipping to maintain that even height and create the multi-tiered effects. Um, yews would be a good one as well, and rhodes, dogwoods, shmyrias. Thank you. <laughs> Aren't you use poisonous? Oh yes, wonderful. Yes. Feel free to use the coconuts. Yes, get them off stage. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Fascinating. Now we move on wait, to. Wait, 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 one more question. What is the most useful thing to cut a shrubbery We're with? We're not taking questions. Cutting <laughs> <laughs> pruning shears. <laughs> You just wanted to hear him say pruning shears. Oh, just <laughs> you just went down to peg and ways wise in the ways of science. <laughs> Moving along, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. We have Dr. Scott, is it Jin, Jinda? 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 <laughs> Dr. Scott Gindy, BSMS, PhD, Fisheries and Ocean Science, University of Washington, affiliated faculty, Oregon State University, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife University, De Concepcion, Chile, School of Oceanography, affiliated University, Facility University of Montana, maybe that's Maine, I don't know my M's, College of Forestry and Conservation, <laughs> founding member, International Committee on the Marine Mammal Protected Areas, National Science Board Advisor for No Unusual Mortality Events, what's that? For Marine Mammal Protection Act, National Science Foundation Panel Reviewer, Certified Board Operator, Department of Interior, Official Sports Licensing License, License Holder, at State of Alaska, Official Driver's License Holder, State of Alaska, Official <laughs> Truck Owner, State of Alaska. <laughs> Sir, for you I have this question, what is a frugivore? Uh, frugivore is um, any species, could be omnivore, could be uh, herbivore, that focuses its diet on eating the fruit or the succulent parts of plants. That's a frugivore. Can I talk about plants now? I thought, <laughs> I thought it had to do with vampires. They're fruit bats. Number two. What? Did you, where did Jamie go? Did you bring the, did you bring the book? Great. We're just going to throw this around when he answers this one. Oh, boy. Nice catch. It's hard to see. That's our frugivore. <laughs> just feel free to pass it to the guy next to you. What 
is the feasibility of coconut dispersion by avian beasts of burden. Feel free to expound. Okay. Um, seed dispersion by uh, coconuts by avian species. So uh, you have two components here. You have the bird component and you have the coconut component. And the using deductive reasoning, you would say, well, what's the what's our testable hypothesis on this? Uh, that would be whether or not that the birds can disperse coconuts, right? That's the question. Okay. Uh, so starting with the coconuts, uh, coconuts are a uh, uh, coccus genus coccus. <laughs> uh, specific epithet is uh, nucifera, and it's. Uh, the etymology of this is that uh, it's a, from the Greek uh, Portuguese word uh, meaning skull or head based on the elongated nose, two dimples, and the coconut, right? Uh, it's an angiosperm of the uh, family Ericaceae, and uh, it is a, uh, it's the, the male and female flowering uh, parts uh, occur on the same iridescence, so it, that makes it monoecious, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a grass. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so they recently did a uh, hierarchical Bayesian analysis of all of the genotype uh, studies uh, using a number of microsatellite loci, and they found that uh, the origins of the of the palms, uh, cultivated palms, uh, cocoa palms, uh, were from primarily from the Southeast Asian islands and the Indo-Pacific. So they were all coastal and a marine origin. And um, <laughs> suggesting that they weren't, <laughs> suggesting that they weren't dispersed necessarily by birds, but by uh, coastal marine currents. So uh, that, in addition to the fact that the coconut fruit uh, is the uh, is very large and positively buoyant. And there's been some reports that a coconut can survive as long as 120 days drifting in the ocean, ocean and still oh uh, successfully germinate on clay, on sand-rich soils, which are low in clay and highly porous. Uh, so the coconuts are about one and a half kilograms. Um, so it's not likely that the birds are eating the coconuts and dispersing them. Right? It would so now we, so how, so how could that happen? So they could carry them, right? So how would a bird carry a, co how big would a bird need to be to carry a coconut? Well, general rule of the thumbs is that birds don't carry, scaled across all species, birds don't carry things more than twice, more than half of their body weight. So for example, a harpy eagle, which is about nine kilos, has been documented to carry about a four kilo three-toed sloth. Scaling it down by other raptors, a um, peregrine falcon, about one kilo, can carry about a 0.4 a kilogram pigeon. So a rule of thumb is that it can't carry more than half its body weight. So a bird to carry it would have to need to be a one and a half kilo coconut would have to be about three kilograms. Okay. So I recently did a literature search on the types of birds associated with coconut palm plantations. <clears throat> and... Uh, these are very quite common. Uh, you know, there's the uh, Asian, uh, the Asian paradise flycatcher, right? right. Uh, the Oriental magpie robin, of course. the Indian tea pie, oh, yeah. uh, the purple rumped uh, sunbird, okay. or oh, the trickles flower pecker, and uh, the greater racket tailed drongo. I love birds. So, <clears throat> and then those less commonly associated with palm plantations were the Indian cock of the rock. The lazy uh, cysticola, the yellow-billed oxpecker, the lanyard tip babbler, and um, the Himalayan snowcock. So uh, those are some species, but in all of these species, none weigh three kilograms. So why'd you read them? <laughs> They're names that would appeal to you. They were associated with cocoa palm plantations. So they were, the, none of these birds are big enough to carry. So, so how big would a bird need to be, such as a swallow, in order to carry a three, uh, one and a half kilogram coconut to the Eurasian continent? Well, so uh, in general, 
uh, there are a number of considerations about uh, how much a bird can carry based on wing loading and drag and force and environmental conditions. But in general, there's a there's a cubic it, there's the rule of uh, doubling to cubic ratio. Okay, so um, the the and so as the cross length of muscle goes up. Um, it, it generally uh, squares in terms of strength, and, but it cubes about. in terms of weight. Exactly. So if you had a swallow, as they mentioned in, the, in, in there, and you double, a swallow is typically about 16 grams with a wingspan of about 32 centimeters. So if you were to uh, scale that up, to three kilograms, double the weight of a one and a half kilogram coconut, uh, you would have a doubling of the wingspan uh, would increase the strength by four times, but increase the weight by eight times. So a three kilogram swallow would have a wingspan of right around 4.9 feet. So unlikely that the common swallow in the movie picked up a coconut and carried it across the Eurasian continent. African or European? <laughs> Can you do all that with American measurements now? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that brief American. talk about American. the feasibility of coconut distribution. And thank you, that was uh, Dr. Scott Jindy. Right there. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. That was a lot of math. Thank you. And he's um, just a bird guy. It, he's not a physicist. He was covering a lot of ground there. He was. I'm, I'm, that's the difference between like a, a PhD bird? and a that's master's a degree right there. <laughs> Please, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome an actual doctor, though I can't believe it sometimes. He's a BSMD, AAP C, MDTP. Who's got the TP? Dr. Amy Dressel, right here. <laughs> Got embroidered and everything. That's how you know it's real. <laughs> so, bring out your dead. Bring out your dead. Huh? Yeah. How does one collect correctly assess the vitality of a human body? Can we assume if it is uttering syllables, it is ostensibly alive? And if so, how do we account for certain individuals in our society who appear in all instances to in fact be dead, but continue to, for example, lead both our state and our nation? <laughs> Quite a loaded question there. There's a lot of in that. Uh, so the signs of life you look for in somebody to check if they're dead is if they have a heart rate and if they're breathing. Um, so you can essentially just have a heart rate and be breathing and be alive, but not have any other functions going on, right? So like brain dead, which is like people you were talking about. And uh, no, I didn't say that. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Is, oh. Uh, other things you can look for, so if you are uh, passing on this mortal realm, right, uh, things tend to, like your blood tends to pool, so you can get things where the blood tends to settle wherever the body touches the ground, so if they start looking darker on half their body, and, you know, if things start to get, like muscles start to get stiff, that's a good sign that you're probably not going to be able to party on Saturday night, but I don't know, sometimes, you know. And if anybody's a Princess Bride fan, you know that you can be dead and appear dead, but be only mostly dead. Not dead yet. Yet. But uh, the death that they were talking about in Python at the very beginning was most likely the plague, right? Everybody knows the plague, right? There's several plagues. So this would be the European plague or the Black Plague. The finer of the plagues. Yeah, the finer of the plagues. <laughs> um, that uh, basically was carried around by a tick bite from rats, right? And so what would happen was you'd get uh, swelling and discoloration near the tick bite, and then the lymph nodes would swell. You'd start to have fevers. You'd get headaches, get kind of chills and feel not so good. And then you'd get, like, headaches and stomach aches. And then because it was the black plague, what would happen is that tissue that was, like, the furthest away or tissue that needed not as much blood as other things started to basically rot off, right? So your nose and your fingers and your toes would turn black and rot off, you know? All this good stuff you guys like to hear about. So, uh, what else? Yeah. Uh, th well, that was encouraging. <clears throat> so, cannibalism, for or against? <laughs> well, on a 
obviously, you know, uh, there's not a whole lot of nutrition in the human body. You know, you're not going to get a whole lot of stuff from, like, even your friend, you know, type of thing. Uh, <laughs> you can boil the human body down and take away all the minerals, and it's not worth a whole lot. It's like less than $200 for all the different minerals in the body. So, um, and by the time that you probably would process the human body, I'm sure that, you know, the blood would be drained from a lot of the different muscles, so it'd be kind of tough and not so very very good to eat um, but I don't know I mean I didn't talk to Alfred Packer and see if like on the Donner Pass if freezing it helped a little bit you know kind of keep it fresher and not so chewy or you know what type of thing so glad I asked <laughs> kind of a joke question but she really just went for it <laughs> all the way wonderful question three Please tell us about what sort of massive blood and or tissue loss one, perhaps say a black knight, could sustain and still uh, uh, be filled with some sort of life. <laughs> All right. Well, so uh, let's see. About 7% of your weight is made out of your blood, right? So the rest is all other, other fluids and tissue and stuff. So... Um, Usually, and anybody you have, uh, like say a 50, 150 pound, 180 pound man, woman has about 1.2 to 1.5 gallons of blood in you. So usually you don't notice blood loss um, until you start getting um, symptoms, right? And you start getting symptoms when you're below a certain threshold where like your blood's not carrying as much oxygen. So you start getting dizzy or you start feeling like you can't breathe as well. Um, it's about... You don't notice any change in your vital signs until you're about 30% of your blood losses down. So that would be like your blood pressure would start to go, your heart rate would increase. Um, you would definitely feel really dizzy by that point. And about 40% of blood loss, so about uh, 0.5 gallons down or 200, 200 milliliters down, then you probably would necessarily not be functioning very well at all and not be able to stand. So, um, But if you're particularly talking about losing limbs, here we go. So the muscles you want to go through, here you go, me. all right, so here's your anatomy lesson, right? So I'm going to list off the stuff that you're going to cut through in order to chop off someone's arm. You guys want to hear that? Yeah. All right. Of course. So first of all, and it depends where on the arm you're doing it, but it was closer to the shoulder, right? So uh, you could cut initially through the deltoid, the end of the deltoid, and then the biceps, the long and short arms of them. Um, there's a musculocutaneous nerve right underneath that and then a cephalic vein, and then uh, the axillary artery, which is what's gonna be a good blood loss from that, from there. And then down deeper, then you have some more uh, arteries, some humeral arteries, and the branch of the brachial artery, and then the uh, anterior circumferential artery, right? And then once you get down through those, there's a little nerve branch called the brachial plexus, and then you get down to the bone, which is what the arm bone is named? Fibula, fibula, the arm bone. Humorous. Yeah, it's very humorous, very good. All right. And then once you get through that bone, then on the back, then you're going to be going through the tricep and the brachial artery back there and the ulnar and median nerve and then the radial and collateral arteries and then the basilic vein and the brachial vein and then the arms chopped clean off. So there's the front and there's the back. So it's very exciting. Yeah, it's a lot. And then on the leg, if you're going to slice off someone's thigh, right? There's a bunch of nice things down there too. So uh, you got some the fascia lata on the top, and then you go through different muscle groups like the sartorius, the rectus femoralis, the vasto-medial, and the vasto-lateris. Uh, the abductor longus, brevis, and magnus are all kind of grouped together. Yeah, I can remember those, right? Um, and then the gracilis is kind of like on the side, but it's still going to get that too. Um, the iliotibial tendon um, is on the side too, right? Yeah, yeah you don't Try want to do stretch that. Stretch that out. That's it, you need to stretch it out. Um, the femoral nerve and the femoral artery and vein, and then there's a deep femoral vein underneath there. And then this, you know, you're going to hit the saphenous nerve before you hit the, what's the bone? Femur. Femur. Yes. Leg bone. There you go, leg bone. <laughs> yes, the femur. And then behind the bone, femur, then you have the, the, end of the, the back end of the sciatica nerve. Uh, the gluteus maximus feeling, uh, the uh, lateral femoral artery and the circumferential artery, the inferior gallimus, and then the uh, fastus lateralis, the quadrus <laughs> retinus, and the 
You're just saying bird no, names now. Yeah, bird names. I know. <laughs> and then the break you'll come out. So there you go. Yeah. And the wood cotton. So right there. <laughs> just in case you ever wanted to know. So, a lot. Yeah. It wouldn't take much. Wonderful. Well, that's terrific. Thank you, Dr. Amy. That incredibly detailed account of all the things you would cut through in arm and leg. And last and certainly not least, ladies and gentlemen, we have <coughs> the hydrologist to the stars. You didn't know they had one of those. <laughs> he is tenured at state institutions at a man-made structurally enclosed ecosystem. I don't think that's what you can call a bathroom, but that's fine. <laughs> at federal riverine research agencies, educational nonprofits, and on an ice field. He presented research on applied fluvial geomorphology, was president of the American Water Resources Association, was a hydrologist for the Alaska Department of Natural Resources, and published the much better analysis of select stream flow modern in Southeast Alaska at Cornell University. That is uh, Tara Schwartz, BS, MPS, and all around B-A-D-A-S-S. -S. Please welcome <laughs> <laughs> So, sir. I like that last title. That was nice. So we have Thank for you. you this quick question. Tell us here and now, these people present, without water, can you please tell us how many witches are in this room today? Um. <laughs> That's a tough one because I'm I'm just not really a witch person. I'm a water person. Oh, that's right. I got to talk on the mic. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. I got a loud voice. Uh, yeah, I'm not a I'm not a witch person. I'm a wa like water water. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but next question. I'll try the next one. All right, well, <coughs> if you didn't have a duck nearby, what else could you use to weigh against a witch? <laughs> <laughs> well. I think that's more a question for Dr. Gende than, <laughs> than, than, than small pebbles, maybe. <laughs> so Dr. Amy is telling me small pebbles. But I, again, I'm not a witch person, and I'm not a bird person. So. Tall boys. Tall boys. I get you tall boys, yeah. <laughs> or a shrubbery or a herring. Okay, we but have all water. those things, I'm not the expert. Water. Water question? Water. Witches. <laughs> yeah. Well, how about can you actually turn somebody into a newt? She's a warlock. Um, ah, aha. I don't know. I've got one. Okay. Yeah. Do you prefer fresh or salt water when dunking witches? Uh, oh, okay. All right. All right. You're getting there in my my bellywick. Um, well, I prefer fresh water to salt water. <laughs> Thank you. Experience. <laughs> education, <laughs> education experience. So, w what are... <laughs> what are the most reliable methods for measuring a uh, an object's buoyancy? <laughs> water... Say that one again. Water? Water, water the most... Reliable, reliable methods, methods. For measuring an object's buoyancy. Buoyancy. Ah. Um, well, yes. uh, oh, like a water well. <laughs> it's deep. It's a deep subject on water. Oh, yes. We're all wet. Oh boy. Let the answer flow. <laughs> can I drop the mic now? <laughs> we'll have to say some more stuff. Uh, Keep going, everybody. Just not just I got not much to say. Um, Okay. Let me get let me get my composure here. I'm trying. I'm You're trying. Good, You're very trying. <laughs> <laughs> Is this what I get for being last? Yeah, being last. Okay. Um, Maybe they want to hear about shrubberies. Shrubberies. Yeah. <laughs> More shrubbery questions. Um, oh man. It's so hot in here. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, buoyancy. So. Yeah, my, my, my big question with this uh, Monty Python and Holy Grail was, uh, oh, damn, I'm so bad at radio. roll. Okay, uh, was the witch, yeah, weighing of the witch with the, the, uh, the what was it, the duck. The, the, duck. Duck. the duck. Previously mentioned duck. The previously mentioned, yeah, woodchuck duck. <laughs> um, so I, I really appreciated that scene because it's a completely poor scientific methodology in that she, the, what is it, Sir Bedivere, uh, was trying to start the scientific method, you know, in the, in the dark ages there when the scientific method hadn't really been put to, put to work yet. And uh, 
he was basically making a false equivalence between uh, the witch that was uh, dressed up as one and uh, if a witch, let's just go through there. Remember, everyone remembers the scene. It's, so, do you, I remember, it's, I have actually the whole thing. Are you like me to read it? No. <laughs> she looks like one. Bring her forward. <laughs> now, let's just get to the good stuff. Uh, burn her anyway. Quiet, quiet, says Sir Bedivere. Uh, so, you're telling me whether she's a witch? Are there? Are there ways? Tell us, did they hurt? Uh, so, what do we do with witches? What do we do with witches? Burn them! Burn them! Well done. Yeah, I want you guys to be the crowd. This is really going to be fun. Okay. And what what do you burn apart from witches? Four witches. <laughs> and then somebody else says... Wood. Wood. Ah. So, why do witches burn? They're made of wood. It took them about 15 seconds to figure that out. Good. Good, good. So, how do we tell if she's made of wood? Build a bridge out of her. <laughs> but can't you build a bridge out of stone as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Does wood sink in water? Yes. No. No. Yes. 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 No. Yes. Myrtle's answer is correct. Yes and no. <laughs> no, it floats, Bedivere says, his first false f falsism. <laughs> so what should we do with her? Throw her in the pond! Uh, what else floats in water? Oh, okay, we're going to go through it. Bre bread, apples, very small rocks, cider, great gravy, cherries, mud, churches, which is my favorite, lead, which definitely doesn't float in water, and uh, King Arthur says, A duck! Who are you who is so wise in the ways of science? <laughs> exactly! Uh, so logical. So if she weighs the same as a duck, then she is a duck. Made, of made of wood. And if she's made of wood, then she is a witch. Which is completely false, right? So they're not working on <laughs> weight, but density. And even density would not be able to define what uh, if she was made of wood and therefore a witch. Because what... Well, you could so how other way what other ways could we decide if she was made of wood? We could cut her. She could try to cut her arm off and she wouldn't bleed and go right. in the shop. No. I'm so She'd sorry. Have sap come out. She'd have you sap come out. Or yeah. Or trebuchet. That's right, we call her trebuchet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what we learned, but so <laughs> yes. not quite as easy as that. So uh ready? Well, thank buoyancy. You. Yeah, thank buoyancy, you buoyancy. buoyancy. Ah! <laughs> oh, wow, that was brutal. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. The famous historian is dead. Well, any questions from the audience? Make them few and far between. For any of our wonderful scientists. Yes, you've been waiting all night. You do death really well. Oh, I'm not quite, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> He's almost dead. I'm almost dead. Wonderful. Are we, are we, would we, uh, good, we're good. Did you, you know more butter questions? Good, we shave the cow to reduce that drag. Wonderful, yes, over here, quick, yes. Is it possible for two birds to carry a seven pound Well, that's an excellent question. If you have two small birds, could they carry a large object? And cooperation has only been documented in birds for breeding and foraging, not for carrying items. There has been a few bird species that have demonstrated insight, intellectual insight. That includes some cetaceans and some of the old world apes and some of the corvids, like uh, common ravens, Corvus clara. Uh, but my guess is, is that if you really wanted to move mountains and you wanted to work birds, I would say you would go to the um, relative to the tufted tit mice, the not the not the blue tits or the marsh tits, but the great tits. Right? <laughs> and uh, so if you had a pair of them working together 
uh, are we talking about again? You, <laughs> a, a, right, a pair right. of those species right. could topple kingdoms. So <laughs> that's my answer. What about boobies? What about boobies? Let's thank our panel of those wise and ways of science. <laughs>